What a sellout. How could she? Dude, go she's to- going to the Grammys. Go to the fucking Grammys. Go to the yeah. Grammys. Let her go to the <laughs> Grammys. <laughs> Hello! Um, we're doing another episode of Global Wine News, which we actually haven't done in a long time. It's been two or th- two uh, months? Two months, I reckon. I yeah, think it's since been a we've actually while. put anything out. Um, because we basically made the decision, let's not just try to troll the inf- in- internet for the most like basic entry level. It was a lot of boring wine yeah, news. Yeah, boring wine news. So yeah. now we decided to just go, well, if there's something relevant, something interesting to like dissect, that's what we do. Uh, and I have the driver's seat this time. I'm horrified. <laughs> <laughs> um, but basically, um, this happens every kind of six months. Not this, but what we're about to discuss. Every six months, some major publication across the world decides to, it's time to talk about natural wine to keep the kids interested yeah. and relevant. Yeah. So uh, this time it was the ABC's turn. Uh, so this came out a little while ago, but we wanted to talk about this, but we haven't actually gotten together, all, all of us in this room and had the chance to do it. It's been mm-hmm. that kind of busy period of the year. So we thought we'd get into it and dissect it. Cool. So uh, just to get us started, Henry, what do you actually know about natural wine? Uh, that if I was going to make a wine, it would probably end up being natural wine. And <laughs> it's because I don't know how to make proper, like not natural wine. It would just be like, I've left oh, some grapes wow. somewhere for a long time and I think they're booze now. There's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> there's, there's, oh, wait, sorry. You, you, I haven't succinctly and efficiently explained everything about natural wine. No, 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 no. 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 You did in a way. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> Your way. Hands off. That not only gave credit, but also insulted a lot of people. <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> big compliment sandwich. Um, yeah, okay. So essentially uh, what this article does is go through uh, goes through the, the current zeitgeist of natural wine and saying, natural wine is having a moment in Australia. It's like, it's been going on for a decade now. So I mm, think we've, yeah, we've yeah. had a pretty long moment, but mm. basically... Uh, it starts and going like, these are the cool, uh, interesting bottles of wine, funky colors, funky labels, something that's a little bit left of center for what we've grown up surrounded by, which is, you know, white label, Sanskrit, red label, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. So uh, what we've got now is basically they've gone through this and they've interviewed a whole bunch of great people within the natural wine movement uh, to get their opinions, thoughts, and actually come up with this article of explaining what it is right now. And they do a kind of mixed bag job of it. Uh, so, uh, Anton von Klopper from Lucy M, formerly Lucy Margot, not allowed to call it Margot anymore, understandably oh, so. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. They got onto him? I think so. Oh, it's, wow, it's okay. Lucy, it's Lucy M now. But well, we all know what it really is. We all know what it really is, which is great. <laughs> um, so, basically, he describes it as organically farmed fruit. That's mm-hmm. the essential part of it. It's the mm-hmm. only time it's mentioned in this article. Um, and then nothing added at any stage. This is the particularly hardcore variant of natural wine. So ferments naturally, unfined, and just pure, just juice. This is what they call zero zero now. Zero like this zero is the new stratification of yep. wine, natural wine. Nothing added, nothing taken away is the little uh, catchphrase tagline. Yeah. So what I said. <laughs> well, well, not di- not dissimilar. Like you're yeah. right, and this is the, this is the essence. But you know, it is the it is really difficult to turn out amazing looking wine made in that that particular way oh mine wouldn't be good <laughs> it'd be natural though i wouldn't put anything else Depend- in. Are you, would you be paying the prices for organic fruit though that's the crucial pr- crucial thing you have to buy organic fruit to call it natural wine correct no, okay, yeah. go. <laughs> fruit shop um so basically the the article goes on to explain that natural wine is kind of this weird tangential, nothing really hard or defined movement. Mm. Uh, and that kind of has a negative connotations somewhat. Yeah. So do you think, Brendan, yourself, does natural wine need hard data certifications? Does it need to track mar- market share growth? Is it? Does is this movement in need of definition? Oh, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> no, these things are meant to be 20 minutes long. Um, no, okay, so yeah, I think it's ironic that we start to go towards I, I see the reasons why it needs more definition because consumers are bloody confused they're not mm-hmm. too sure what is natural what's not natural um not really recognizing the fact that the reason why natural wine the movement itself kicked off initially was to uh sort of go against the rules and not have any rules and start to you know because it was once upon a time that wine red wine was deep dense rich alcoholic and oaky and white wine uh was a plethora of everything from oaky to you know very one-dimensional mm. although approachable in that respect um the 
natural wine movement kind of brought in this concept of guys wine is whatever you want it to be for sure um now yeah and this has led to a lot of consumer confidence issues the as like henry you're saying you know you know you make natural wine but it might not taste great no well this sort of really epitomizes the, the whole movement because I would say um, the best and the worst wines I've ever tried have come out of this movement. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, and that, again, is it goes back into the, the marketing thing of it. Um, the market itself has actually developed its own form of of definition. Yeah, for sure. I feel. I yeah. think, you know, even even at the, the most semantical level between natural and natty, you know, n- not a lot of people in my mates you know, from, from, you know, rural Queensland – um, would ever go, oh, I'm, I'm out here drinking natural wines. But I tell you what, I had a couple of mates recently that made it big over in London. Now they're like stockbrokers or something like that. And they're all going, yep, I'm out in Greece having the natty booze and they're putting, you know, selfies with it. I'm like, these are guys that grew up drinking Forex Gold. You know, so something must be, something must be penetrating into into those areas where people usually wouldn't, wouldn't actually have wine in general. Well, this is the thing that um, uh, Campbell Thomas Burton, who's an incredible natural wine importer, has his own little um, no ads shop that he's just set up in in Melbourne, uh, is basically saying that this movement has done exactly that. It's actually got young people into wine that wouldn't normally drink wine until their mid to like 30s. Mm -hmm. Like now there's 18 year old kids, like 25 year old kids, like going to these shops and going, I'd like a bottle of natural wine, please. Sometimes they're going, what? What you, you were in the wrong places at BWS. Um, but, yeah. you know, basically because this movement has got Instagram on its side, rappers talking about yeah. it, it's millennials and influencers and all that kind of thing. Do, do you and your mates kind of drink this kind of stuff? Uh, I drink a little bit of natural wine, but, I, you know, my mates aren't a great cross-section for it because I am the most progressive wine drinker in them and I'm not a very progressive wine drinker. Uh, going back to what, like not going back to but it does seem like wine for hipsters like it wouldn't surprise me if you're taking it home in a tote bag um most of these shops sell tote bags <laughs> <laughs> uh, but do you reckon it's a pro- like a product of um like in south australia you were so ingrained into the wine industry earlier mm. because you just by sheer proximity to it like if you look at someone that's sort of born and raised in Melbourne, that yeah, whilst they have their own wine industries, they're not exactly like thirty minutes away. Yeah, like not all of them anyway. Yeah, um, everything like the closest to the Yarra Valley, and that's over an hour away. Yeah, and same sort of deal with um, uh, you know Sydney and Brisbane, mm-hmm. where I would say if you were to look at the data, I don't know this for for anything, but I would say that the vast majority of wine purchasing is happening in these cities in this category. Absolutely. Um, and, Absolutely. and maybe because they don't have an idea of like, they were never raised on Barossa Shiraz. They probably haven't even tried it before. Yeah. You know, so they've got nothing to field their sort of. It, just, it sort of like, it sort of feels like free range eggs and like it's this sort of counterculture yeah. to like mm. the reason that young people are drinking it is because people are trying to be more like environmentally conscious. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, farmers markets, all the. But I'm saying a lot of buzzwords here, yeah. but that small sort of vibe. Pro- small producers. Triple J. Like <laughs> hemp seeds, well, yeah, yeah, we, I th- yeah I backwards think, caps. You can get hemp flavored wine. Yeah, there's hemp. There's co fermented hemp wine. See, like I don't know any. I'm just throwing words out here. <laughs> like, yep, yep you're bags, absolutely yep, right. Hemp well, this this is the thing that uh, this article goes on to explain. Like, this is the millennial beverage. Yeah, and uh, there's a quote saying that this is for millennials that have given up on buying a home because natural wine is apparently expensive. There's more. It's common for like these wines to go for thirty dollars, forty dollars, fifty dollars, sixty dollars plus yeah. for a bottle of wine. So natty wine by night, smashed abo by day, sort of people. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting, yes. like when you actually consider um, the people making these comments. I wonder what they grew up drinking, and I wonder what like the, the exactly you know because my my folks weren't. Um, weren't gravitating always to, you know, expensive bottles, but they weren't, uh, you know, uh, far from, you know, being able to get a really nice cask in the fridge if there was ever such a thing. But yeah. they were like the nice little Yolumba two-litre casks. I right? had uh, debordedly cab sav in the fridge in that little top right pocket that was that's ingrained in my you know, brain. And so I wonder if that was like the concept of what midweek wine looked like. And mm-hmm. I wonder if if midweek wine were, as, were sitting in that category of, of natural wine, if there was like a natural wine producer that was like, I'm going to do cask only, whether or not... This whole concept of natural mm. wine being expensive, you know, translates across. Or is it just that it just reflects that wine isn't such shouldn't be a cheap commodity? Or is this the price that it should be? Yeah, yeah. Do, does everyone else living. needs needs to rejig. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is what uh, Kai Dixon is quoted in saying. It's like he 
can't afford to buy his own wine at the restaurants he sells to. Yes, and he yes. makes he makes a tiny quantity of fruit in a in a little country town, mm-hmm. so he can't just go to like um, X fancy fine dining restaurant that purchases wine and pay one hundred and eighty dollars for a dago and spend another eighty dollars on a bottle of wine. Is it, I think it just gets down to the crux that no one natural winemakers aren't getting rich off this stuff. It's not like they're no. charging sixty dollars to you know to get rich and buy a yacht or anything like that. This is just the money that they need to survive and keep running their business. And there is there is the dynamics that are in play in us particularly in the australian wine industry where you do need to to work at scale um and i think even when we were looking at so just sheer size of vineyards i think you needed to be when we were sort of running through the math of average prices and whatnot you really need to be something like 120 acres for you to be able to justify bringing on staff so you can actually make enough money to be able to pay yourself a let's say a 60 to 75 grand a year wage Mm. Um, and you look at 120 acres, you're like, man, that's that's a lot. That is a lot of vineyard. And in fact, to acquire that now is two, three, four million dollars in a in a you know a semi decent area that's say not the Riverland. Um, and so you have this sort of like floor size that has been sort of imposed upon uh, you know these industries to be able to be actually financially stable. Although, like uh, when it comes to things like natural wine it becomes really hard to do that at scale. So these two things are actually working against each other. The minimum size to be financially comfortable is set, the bar is set now so high. Mm. And these people are trying to be able to produce wine in the most philosophical, you know, moral and ethical manner. And they can't. And so you've got this sort of like, they're too small. So they need to make up the difference with higher prices. So it feels a bit like the the natural wine industry is sort of destined to be the I don't know the counterculture to other wine where you can get like commercially produced like if you think about like a someone who's doing a really small batch homebrew beer that's never going to take over the market if there's a it you're just not gonna be able to produce enough to supply the market like it's never going to take over natural wine is it yeah but have a look at wildflower wildflower is like you know a really great example of of brewing in a very different manner catering for a very similar crowd and people actually paying and you know a little bit more for it um but the the article the article I think in terms of journalism I wasn't exactly so I read the article and I've read the thing and I'm sure we'll link it in the description yeah. as well. Yeah, there's like a really things. good video on it and yeah. I I there was there's a lot of conjecture. Yeah, in and this. and probably the most uh, quoted controversial statement is um, uh, there was an, a winemaker that decided not to be interviewed but he gave the liberty for, of a particular quote which is basically I don't do enough cocaine to be a part of the natural wine scene. And does this actually damage the actual scene of natural wine? Or is this just an indication that pretty much everybody does cocaine? Uh, <laughs> hey, speak for yourself. Um, no, like in, in general, it's not just the natural wine scene. It is uh, lawyers, uh, it's doctors, it's um, yeah, everyone like, at a Melbourne Cup event. Like it's not just this part of the world. Most <laughs> most groups of people do cocaine. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's true, but it's it's interesting. Like yeah, like obviously the people out yet. the people that <laughs> I suppose can afford that could also probably afford natural wine. And I think there's there's but there's always been these sort of uh, dichotomies where people are like oh look I really want to get my farmed organic produce, but then you know take a 30, yeah. 40 minute car ride. Um, you know, just to go and <laughs> yeah. go and buy them. There's a black Uber out the front. I'm gonna go jump in and go for a block. Yeah, <laughs> and and so it is really, it is a dichotomy. It doesn't, it doesn't really make uh, a hell of a lot of sense. But yeah, there was uh, certainly a period where uh, you know, if I was traveling to Sydney on a trade run and whatnot, yep. um, you know, you'd see a lot of that going on. Yeah, but for sure. you know, what else? What else do you expect? A whole bunch of young people that are finally onto something that people are willing to pay lots of money for in fine dining, like what do you expect to happen? Of course it's gonna happen in a city centre like like Sydney. This 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 ha- this happened before yeah. um, natural wine was in, in Australia. This will happen if they if natural wine Probably stops, it'll still happen. It's just this is coinciding with you know with culture. Yeah, but um, it's it's funny that <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea that that was a connection. Like I didn't realize that we were just talking about coke then either. I thought you were back talking about wine. Like what's going um, on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it is like a bit of a, a bit of a thing. Like you know these these uh, once you build up, it's like chefs being built up into rock stars. Winemakers yeah. got built up into rock stars as well. So all the natural wine producers, the meme is that they're all on coke. That's a meme. It's, it's a meme. It's not exactly the it's truth. It's not the truth. Yeah, the meme. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's more about the. I think it's more the people around them, and it is actually the people. That's not one hundred percent the case. Okay, 
And it's also just yeah. the it's the hospitality community. It's that it's it is, industry, it is changing. It's, it's everything. Well, it's absolutely changing. Seems conflicting. Like it's the the meme of like uh, Melbourne yuppie who only drinks herbal tea also loves doing acid on the weekend. Like how can that's you be all about natural wine but then also be like it's exactly it's exactly the same thing. It's exactly it's exactly the same thing. Cool. Exactly the same. I'm yeah. well, not cool. Bad. Don't do drugs, kids. But Sounds cool. <laughs> yeah, but it is it is starting to change. There has been a big, uh, and I actually was quite cynical about it maybe about five, six years ago, but this sort of wellness movement yep. is finally sort of hit critical mass. Yeah. And a lot of people taking things like um, even bar culture and stuff like that, we're starting to, and I think that's even fueled the flames of natural winemaking pundits For sure. everywhere because they're like, well, if we are going to be caring about what we put in our bodies, at least we're going to be opting yep. for something that means something. And natural wine has more inherent, I think, meaning within the product itself than, than a lot of, you know, conventional, heavily doctored wines. Um, but moving on uh, from cocaine, um, basically, this isn't the first time. This whole article that we go through and like all of these discussions about natural wine and defining mm. it, they did this literally eight years ago. Yeah, wow. They literally did this eight years ago. Time flies. They had a landline did this thing um, a little while ago, which is they got a whole bunch of people criticize, like critiquing and tasting all of these blind natural wines. James <laughs> Halliday was there. Mm -hmm. uh, all the mainstays in the industry were there, which was, you know, Benny and there's Pablo Theodorus. We can flash up a little uh, shot of our good friend Josh Picken, who was, uh, you can see in the little, little baby he? face Josh. Oh, wow. <laughs> Oh, which, wow. Which is very, very fun. He was on Landline, man. That guy's famous. I know, for like 0 0.3 seconds. Oh, wow. It's, it's very funny. Him. But basically, this is this is where we've come from eight years ago, is that James Halliday said, this. Uh, the, the converts tell you, oh, the arch high priest of natural wine, really love these things that are hissing and breaking wind that look murky in the glass and taste murky in the mouth. And the murkier they are, the better they are. And you really do see some strange things at ridiculous prices. Okay, so <laughs> so people, I have to say like, okay, yeah, he's a very flippant statement. But, yeah. you know, I've got to say like, these people bring that on, on themselves. Like the only mm. reason why, the only reason why you've got these, this concept of arch high priests of natural wine is because people were like, oh, it all tastes like shit. And we're like, well... We're trying. It doesn't all taste like shit, but if you go out and say stuff like that, then we're going to retaliate with something more extreme yeah. and then more extreme, <clears throat> and you end up having this 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 you know mass pendulum swing, um, you know. But I mean, the the murky, the arch high priest. A lot of this stuff, a lot of this stuff is like third party people commenting yeah. about others who are actually very down to earth, very pragmatic, like very normal. Yeah, for like sure. Normal, normal people. They just kind of don't want to put something that's oaky and lactony and rich and kind of doesn't have a lot of inherent meaning apart from from financial outcomes for for big wineries. They just want a bit of energy and something interesting and yeah. something vibrant. And delicious. It's a little bit like punk, like punk rock. Like that's why like the the lines of comparison are uh, often drawn between natty wine and punk rock. Yeah, for sure. So you it's know? it feels you know having this little you guys having this little discord in front of me. It feels almost like an anti-establishment sort of. It's not yeah. necessarily about making the tastiest wine. It's about making the most interesting and the most expressive and the most reflective of the environment that it's coming from as opposed to let's just make a million bottles of this really clean white wine that everyone can drink and the, without thinking. And now, like, this, this is a classic thing with most counterculture or um, anti-establishment movements is that now the big guys have started taking notice and then going, well, how about we capitalise? Yeah. Because now you can go to Dan Murphy's and there's a lo fi section at 20% of their stores nationwide. I, I, I like that. Yeah. I exactly. like the fact that people can now, because in Dan Murphy's, I've got to admit, you know, I, I I could be on holiday somewhere where there isn't an indie wine store. I'll go on to a Dan Murphy's. But the range is always pretty shit. I just gravitate towards yeah. bulk beer. If I could find some lo fi wine at Dan's when I'm out in the middle of Airlie Beach, I'm going to be freaking stoked. Yeah. Well, I think you know? anyone, anyone who's saying this lo-fi wine shouldn't be in Dan Murphy's. That seems like a little bit pretentious. It's just like, we're trying to have this like- Yeah, we keep, don't want, keep our we culture. We don't want everyone who doesn't go to, we don't want the Dan Murphy's people drinking our wine. We want it to be like- So like, when you comment about Lord, she's like selling out or something like yeah, that. Yeah. She used to be indie, but now she's not. Yeah, it's, it's actually, so we had, uh, the first year I was at uni, Lord was meant to play at Open Week for the University of Adelaide, right? Yeah. yeah. And they booked her before she'd blown up. 
And then she blew up and had to go to the Grammys the week that she was meant to become an Adelaide Uni or something. And everyone's just like, what a sellout. How could she? Dude, go she's to- going to the Grammys. Go to the fucking Grammys. Go to the yeah. Grammys. How do you go to the Grammys? <laughs> so, like, is, the idea is Dan of, Murphy's the Grammys? <laughs> <laughs> the Grammys of alcohol? <laughs> oh, no. Uh, um, but basically, well, now now we're getting into this point where it's like now lo fi wines have infiltrated Dan Murphy's as a 20%. Um, in 20% of stores is this lo-fi section. Mm-hmm. Now there's producers that are jumping on the bandwagon and calling themselves natural yep. and saying that they're natural when they don't inherently ascribe to the rules set, let out by the, you know, the forefathers and people doing yeah, it earlier. The, going, the, it's, the arch it's not, high priest. It's, yeah, the arch high priest. It's not from organic vineyards. Yep. Uh, there is sulfur and there might be some adjustments. Yep. But it, in minimal amounts. But they're just saying natural wine on the mm. front of their bottle or whatever. Is this a direct link to there not being enough definition that uh, people can take advantage of like, this? It feels like organics, like certified organics. Like I can't grow bananas that aren't organic and call them organic. Yeah, but then it's like what's natural, what's not natural. And this is still comes back to things. So, for example, in our case with, say, Unico, and it's a really good point to reference, Australia is really developed in its, its understanding of what natural wine is to the degree that we now have stratification yeah. of natural wine within natural wine. <laughs> Um, you go to somewhere like the States, which is operating about four or five years behind, and natural wine is a really good word to describe someone who's artisan. Mm. Because artisan was already a word that's been butchered by large companies. So it's sort of like as as you have agency and license over certain terms, it starts to it's just a gradually moving ticker. Mm. Um, you know, in the case of say Unico in, in Australia, no, we wouldn't be described as natural. We certainly wouldn't be described as conventional either. Lo-fi yeah. is probably a much better description of what we are in Australia. Yeah. In America, many would describe us for us without us even being in the room as natural. Mm-hmm. But their understanding of it is very different to, to Australia's understanding of it. It's very different to France's and South Africa's understanding of it. And so I think the danger is when uh, people see value in a label and not in, in the movement's inherent meaning. You know, a lot of people just go, oh, natural means money. Might be throwing a generalization on here, but I think anyone who really cares about, like, is this winery certified organic will probably take the fine time to find out if it's certified organic. Yeah. So the question is, is it a problem for people who don't actually care? Is, is, it, is, it, is it a problem that people think something's natural when it's not quote unquote natural? Like, why is that intrinsically a problem? I think, I think truth, authenticity, yep. transparency and honesty. I think transparency is the only way forward. You know, the, the, for, and there are plenty of producers, uh, and they know who they are, uh, that have said that, like, yeah, we only take from organic vineyards. I'm like, well, you don't, because uh, I, for example, will share a, a vineyard that is conventionally managed with another wine producer that is openly telling everyone that it's organically managed and it's not. But because we go out and be like, no, no, well, we take from organic and conventional vineyards, then suddenly we're penalized in the market. Mm suddenly like a journalist is like, well, you're not natural then. I was like, yeah, but everyone else who's just literally just lied to you has, has, has be- you believe it uh, and they get a financial benefit from it. So there's no, and there's no real um, calling out of it. There's no real, if there was, then you would be completely isolated in the industry mm. um, and you'd find it very difficult to be able to um, sort of operate usually. So I'm, I'm not sure what the answer is there. Or well, my answer is just just don't try not to lie, um, be honest, and make really good product. That's that's really heartfelt and honest, mm. and real. So, just to finish up, should this category grow? Because um, Jasper Button, who was one of the main people interviewed and filmed on Landline, does a fantastic job as well, speaking truth to the to the movement and what he's doing as well. Said we have got to be careful not to grow in size so much that we lose the original idea. So, should there the well, well the, the original idea has been lost, I think. And what hap- what's happening now is that no one knows what the new idea really is. And so, and no one's willing to be able to put words to it for fear of being completely vilified by one side or the other. And so it, it leaves it at a bit of an impasse. But I had an interesting conversation uh, the other day with a guy I used to work for, uh, S- Stephen Panel. S- cool. And he was saying, you know, the, the industry's come so far like it was only a little over than 10 years ago that he was flying up to uh, Queensland to sell wine uh, and they were still putting all of their Pinot in the fridge um, and didn't really understand any other great variety from Shiraz and Pinot and maybe Cabernet. So like we've come so far and it's hard to be able to say that the natural wine movement wasn't a huge intrinsic critical part of that, like a cornerstone really of 
of the future of the industry, I think, I think it should grow. I think people should make more. I think, uh, irrespective of whether you're organic or not organic, I think you just shouldn't lie. Um, and I think you should all try to make wine that that actually reflects a a time and a place and a site and a soil. And I mean, that's my personal mm. personal view. A lot of us have this. I know in the industry, there's this sort of magical hundred hundred ton number that you can't make any more than 100,000 bottles otherwise you're not natural because it is very hard it's stupidly hard to do anything like in that class of naturalness it needs to grow because there's higher demand for it not because people think that there's an opportunity to exploit the brand as an opportunity to sell more of it yeah there's there's two two things there man like you know you gotta remember demand never was high and i think the conventional the conventional wisdom in business has always been supply meets demand and the, the concept is so foreign on many people, especially economists, about what how do you create demand? And these this is what these producers are doing, which is why it's breaking a lot of people's heads. They're creating demand. Mm. They're not they're not satisfying demand. It's not like the demand existed beforehand and people were all running out in the streets going, I want, I want natty booze. They are literally f- creating something new that is mm. really exciting, that has just never existed before. And I think that's that's you need a shift of because that's what got us into Shirazing. Everyone just wants Shiraz, so just give them Shiraz. Like, okay, well, show me the growth in the premium wine category of Shiraz sales in this country. I can't. Yeah, it's no one. It's, it is bombing. It's crashing. Mm. It's, it doesn't exist. Oh man, for, for one, it's the one part of the wine industry that I find truly exciting right now. For sure, is this this whole move and the new producers that we're seeing constantly. We see them on the show. Um, and and the tensions yeah. how how this because that's where the really I, fun interesting I shit think is that's where the the more exciting things lies when we're we're making the the big boys like you know wonder a little bit and go oh shit maybe we should not make big oaky shiraz to sell it 400 dollars. i want to know anymore. i'm fascinated uh and my, it will happen because the, the industry is primed for consolidation right now mm. like when will a big company like a big corporate make it make an offer to acquire a a natty wine producer and which natty wine producer will be the first because the moment that happens there'll be a a, a a whole range of them that'll happen what a lovely note <laughs> <laughs> all right cool that's all we have for just this so cheers, cheers. guys thanks, thanks so, much. so much bye Ciao.